Let's pray and, and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, things like these overwhelm us, and we're so grateful for what you've done in our lives. We want to be the kind of men and women that you've called us to be. So speak to us through your word. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the living word made flesh. Amen. We live in a pretty amazing time in human history, if you think about it. I, I recall years ago with my wife's grandfather, who's passed away now, um, sitting with him in Miami where he lived and talking with him. He was a Baptist minister for 58 years. Uh, sort of the patriarch, legendary guy in our family and in, in the churches in, in, in his area of ministry. I was just picking his brain, asking him questions and wanted to learn and glean wisdom from him. And uh, I said, what's your earliest childhood memory? He said one of his earliest memories was riding in a horse-drawn sleigh in the Saskatchewan territory of Canada with his brother under a buffalo robe while his father, who was an itinerant preacher, went from th church to church, four churches on a Sunday morning. He said what they would do is they'd get out of the horse-drawn sleigh in the wintertime and they'd put the soapstone that was underneath the seat in the sleigh into the wood next to the wood-burning stove in the back of those little churches so it would heat up so they'd be warm when they warm seats when they rode to the next church. That's your earliest memory? And he, he lived to see the era of space travel and the Internet. You know, I mean, think about the world in which he lived. It makes me think about our children, your children, and the generation growing up now. When, 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 the, when the end of their time on earth comes, what will they reflect back on and talk about that will amaze younger generations? The world's changing at a rapid pace. Innovations are happening so fast. What would you say have been sort of the primary or key human technological advances that have given us the most freedom, the most rest, the most leisure and peace in our lives? It'd be an interesting discussion, wouldn't it? We could talk about industrial revolution and, and different modes of travel, the printing press, but what about 1879, this one, the electric light bulb, Thomas Edison? It was supposed to free us, right? Because we used to get up with the sun and go to sleep w when the sun set. And this would give us more opportunities to work at, at our own, on our, work at the time of our choosing. Has, has, it, has that idea set us free? Are we more at peace and more at leisure? I don't think so. I think we just work more and are more restless. How about 1914, the first commercial flight? The beginning of being more connected and having more access to other parts of the world than ever before. Or 1946, this one, the first microwave oven. That thing looks very dangerous to me. <laughs> Let's get that baby away from that oven, you know. <laughs> microwave ovens. Kids, there didn't used to be such a thing. Perhaps you can't believe that. Or 1978, the very first mobile phone. Now, some of you will think I'm making this up, but there was a day when phones had cords and were stuck to your wall or like on your kitchen counter. The first mobile phone weighed about, what, 13 pounds or something like that? It was a giant brick. I remember my dad had one. He had a bag phone. You had to carry around a bag with a battery, which lasted about 28 minutes. 1989, the World Wide Web. Remember when you, have to, remember when you ha used to have to type WWW before everything? The World Wide Web was invented, not by Al Gore, but in 1989. <laughs> or, or the big one, 2007. That's not Jesus, that's Steve Jobs. <laughs> Holding up the very first iPhone. How many of you have an iPhone or a smartphone? Hold it up for a minute. Would you grab it and pull it out? Some of you are, yours are already on. I see you playing Angry Birds, da Danny. <laughs> yeah, or it's in whatever, Candy Crush, whatever it is, right? Hold it up there. Has this set you free? <laughs> All right, put it away. Turn it off. <laughs> No question, these innovations have impacted how we live, had tremendous changes on how we live and how we operate in the world. No one would argue that. But I don't think they've given us more freedom, more rest. In fact, I think we're more restless as a culture than ever before, in part because of these things. The truth is that despite all of our innovations and all of our advances in technology in every other way, we are the most restless culture in human history, I think. And we're turning now to a part of the book of Hebrews in our series called Jesus is Greater where we've been looking at how is he greater, greater than all things in our lives, and in what way is he greater, how does that apply to us, and we're going to look now at this issue, the biblical idea of rest, and what Jesus has to do with that from Hebrews chapter 4. Turn with me if you have your Bibles. We'll read the first 13 verses of Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. 
For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest as he has said. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. And again, he appoints a certain day. Today, saying through David, so long afterward in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from its sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now that is a very confusing passage. Would you admit? When you read that, at first hearing, if you've never read it before, it's like, What? Joshua's mentioned rest, mentioned he's angry, we're supposed to enter rest, and then it jumps to the word of God. At first reading, it, it is very confusing, but eight times in those verses, in 11 verses, we see the word rest mentioned. So whatever the author is trying to say, it has something to do with this idea of rest, whatever that means. The Greek word is the word katapauo. Ah, say that with me, katapauo. <laughs> It literally means to make quiet, to force someone to slow down, settle, and be quiet. Uh, Rest is fundamental to the human condition. We know this because in the Ten Commandments, think of the Ten, the Ten Commandments are sort of the, the framework around rest of God's law is built, the way we're supposed to live, God's picture of human flourishing, what it would look like if we lived rightly in his presence. Those ten and the law built on them. One of the ten is remember the Sabbath day, the Sabbath day of rest, and keep it holy. So rest is mentioned in the same context as don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, don't commit adultery. It's, it's a foundational thing. It's part of what it means to live rightly. Whatever rest is, it's absolutely crucial to human life. It's in the top ten. The first thing we see in the passage here is the promise of rest. The writer of Hebrews here is using the word rest in several different overlapping ways. And you're going to have to try to stay with me because it it is confusing or uh, complicated, but it's really important for us to grasp. Uh, Look at verses 1 through 3 again of chapter 4. He says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. And he goes on to quote the Old Testament. The promise of entering his rest still stands. What's this promise? Okay, now stay with me here. In verse 4, which won't be on the screen, he talks about God resting on the seventh day. He says in verse 4, for, uh, excuse me, that's the wrong chapter. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from his works. You remember that story in Genesis chapter 2, of, in 1 and 2 of creation, right? That God saw all that he had made, he said it's very good, and he rested from his work of creation. Why did God rest? Why did God, did he need a break? Was God wiped out? I'm exhausted, let me catch my breath, and then I'll go on to like overseeing all of this. Not because he was tired. I know it sounds obvious, but it's important that we understand. God did not rest because he was worn out. He rested because it was finished. He was enjoying his finished work. When we rest in him, we enjoy his finished work of creation and in Christ. We'll come back to that idea. So the first thing he's saying is rest in creation. God's rest in creation. Sabbath rest. It's part of how God created the world, and it's part of how he designed us. Rest is about something more than just 
taking a break. Rest is about something more than a, than a one day off a week. That's pointing to something else. We're created in God's image to be in relationship with him and to reflect his glory in the world. And when we rest, we do that. We reflect on who he is and what he has done. But the writer of Hebrews also goes on and then talks about referring back to a specific time. If you were here last week, you heard about this in chapter 3, that they did not enter his rest. And rest in that context means a place, the promised land. Numbers 13 and 14, the Israelites had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. They were on the verge of entering that which God had promised. He delivered them out of slavery in Egypt, and he had brought them to the brink of the promise. And that's referred to as entering his rest. So the land, the place, becomes symbolic of you've been set free now. Liberated from slavery, entering into a land flowing with milk and honey, the place where you can enjoy your, your relationship with God. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, rest in creation, rest as the place, the promise. But all these aren't, they're pointing to something. Can you see that? They're symbolic of something deeper, something more meaningful for us. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15, reads this way. You shall remember that you are a, were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. That's very interesting, the connection there. I want you to remember that what you were, a slave, and remember who, who you are now, free, and remember who did that for you, God, and the, the way I want you to do that is remember the Sabbath day. It's telling us what rest is for. It's not just, whew, need a day off, play some golf, watch some football, take a break. Rest, the pattern of rest weekly, daily, moment by moment in our lives is that we would remember who we were before God got a hold of our lives in bondage, in darkness, enslaved to sin, who, who we are now in Christ, set free. And who did that for us? Jesus. God is the liberator. That's, that's what rest is to do. So rest in creation, when God rests, he rests to enjoy his completed work. We rest to enjoy his completed work in Jesus. Rest as place, was pointing to that deeper spiritual meaning. And that, he says so right there in Deuteronomy 5.15. Here's why I want you to do this. So you remember who you were and what I've done and who you are now. So keeping the Sabbath day of rest is connected to remembering what God has done for you. It, it gets corrupted, though, if you've been around somebody who's serious about Sabbath keeping. I did a wedding years ago for a friend of mine who was, uh, he, he was marrying a girl who grew up as an Orthodox Jew. And she had sort of left the Jewish faith, she still was culturally Jewish, but she'd left the Jewish faith of her upbringing, and it was the big, the big to-do in her family about who was going to come to her wedding or not, because it wasn't a Jewish wedding, it was some Baptist pastor that was going to do it. I was the one doing it, right? And we stayed in this hotel in Texas for the wedding, because it was a good friend of mine, and I vividly remember there were some members of her family that would not ride the elevator on Friday evening from the lobby up to their room. Do you know why? Because Jews hate elevators. You didn't know that? No, that's not why. Because to press the elevator button would be to, to the same as flipping a light switch, it would be to start electricity flowing, which is the same as kindling a fire, which to the rabbis meant you were working. I think it's more work to walk the stairs personally, but that's just me, <laughs> right? But, you, but you, get, now you can admire their devotion to keeping the law, but something's missing in this. Something's missing, which is what we just read. I want you to remember who you were and what I've done and who you are now. That's why we rest, not just physically, but spiritually. So what does this mean for us? We remember that we too have been delivered from sin. So the ancient Israelites, they were to remember they were slaves, they've been set free. Same thing for us today. But here's, here's an important question. Is the author of Hebrews, the writer, is he talking about Christians who are overworked and haven't really entered into the full life that God promises in Christ? Or is he talking about people who really have not even understood what the gospel is and don't understand eternal rest, salvation. Is he talking to believers or unbelievers? The answer is, yeah, both. He's saying this to both people, both groups. Because some of us, we profess with our mouth and believe in our minds that God is who he says he is and that Christ is who he says he was, the Son of God who died for our sins, but it doesn't really make any difference in our lives. We're still running on the treadmill. We're still exhausted spiritually, mentally, and physically. 
And some of us are here, some of you are here, and you've been around cultural Christianity, and this feels like it happened in church, at least I hope it does. And, uh, and, and you, but you don't really know who Jesus is and what he's done for you and what he offers you. Entering into that rest, the rest of knowing that your sins are forgiven, that you're set free, that your future's secure, that, as a good friend of mine used to say, my past is redeemed, my present makes sense, and my future is secure because of Jesus. That's what it means to enter into his rest. And whether you are a Christian or not, you can miss that. Miss that experience. In verse 2, he says, For good news came to us as to them. Good news, the Greek word for good news is euangelion. It's where we get our word, the evangel, the gospel. Gospel means good news. In verse 6, those who formerly received good news failed to enter because of disbelief and disobedience. I mean, you can hear the message and miss it. Next, the power of rest. So rest is the imagery used to talk about God's offer of salvation. In creation, it's there. In the promised land, it's there. In Sabbath rest, it's there. And ultimately, all this points to in Christ. It's a picture of the forgiveness and freedom and acceptance and joy that God is offering in and through his son Jesus that you don't labor for, you don't strive for, you don't acquire, you don't achieve, you don't claim by your own effort. You enter into it by faith in Jesus Christ. In our society, your value and significance is something that you, you generate, isn't it? In our society, your, your identity and value in the world is something that you create, you accomplish, you produce. Even right down to the world of social media. You've got an instant grade on how significant you are called followers and likes. And we chuckle at that, but it's true. Kids are growing up where they can see uh, how many responses did I get? How many retweets did I get? How many likes did I get? And this is doing something to, the, to our souls talking about our significance for many of us this happens through our work the things we do for guys especially but not exclusively guys certainly ladies as well and kids as well you get asked the question when you meet somebody right hey i'm jeff hey i'm bob how you doing what do you do right right that's the question what do you do well right now i'm not doing much of anything but talking to you what if we start answering that way later on i'm going to take a nap and then i might eat a burrito what are you going to do right <laughs> What are you doing? What do you do? What do they mean by that? What's your job? And based on what you say, I'm making evaluative judgments about you. It's always fun when I, they ask me, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Moment of truth. You know? <laughs> I'm a Baptist pastor. <laughs> Come to me. You know, you know, it's like, yeah. I talked to this guy recently who, who moved in next door. And I, we had that conversation. And I said, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pastor. And he went, no blank. <laughs> he went, huh, no shit. He goes, not what I expected. That's what he said. <laughs> I took that as an odd compliment, kind of. But when people say, what do you do? That's what they mean, right? And there's a, there's a judgment made. Oh, how educated are you? How wealthy are you? How secure are you? How smart are you? Whatever, based on what you say you do. We all live in this world. You know what I'm talking about. Once upon a time in human society, your work was the way that you added value to the world and that you provided for your family, but it wasn't your identity. It, wasn't, it never was supposed to be. Judith Shulevitz, a New York Times uh, cultural critic, and wrote a book called Sabbath World, Glimpses of a Different Order of Time. Here's what she writes in her book. Most people believe all you have to do to stop working is to not work. But the inventors of the Sabbath understood, though, that there is much, it's much more complicated undertaking to rest. You cannot downshift casually and easily. This is why the Jewish and Puritan Sabbaths were so exactingly intentional. Even our secular leisure activities cannot do for us what Sabbath rest can do. For religious rituals do not exist just to promote togetherness or fun, they're designed to convey to us a certain story about who we are. The story told by the Sabbath is the story of creation. God rested and we rest in order to honor the image of the divine in us, to remind us that there is more to us than our work. The machinery of self-censorship must be shut down in order to rest, stilling the internal murmur of self-reproach. I love that line. 
stilling the internal murmur of self-reproach. She goes on, she says, in a society that measures status by achievement, in grades, awards, name brand schools, and colleges, the scramble for advantage is bound to propel us into overparenting. And overparenting is closely associated with overworking. And it is harder to opt out of this than you might think. For many of us use our children to jockey for our individual status. She's, she's in this chapter saying how our restlessness is pervasive. It leaks into everything we do, even our parenting. That little voice inside your head and in mine that says, you're falling behind. You're falling behind. Now, here's an example in my life of how this happens. I have a neighbor down the street whose lawn looks like it should be on a Scott's commercial. It's immaculate. I think he cuts it with scissors. I think he paints it green. I don't think it's real. <laughs> he is always out there fertilizing and patching and manicuring. And I don't, I resent that deeply. My wife <laughs> is, his name is Dale. My wife will say to me, Dale's fertilizing. Dale is watering. Dale is planting. You see what Dale's doing? I'm like, I, mm. so one day I was, <laughs> I was walking my dog, and Dale was outside doing what Dale does, you know, in the grass. And I said, hey, Dale, how's it going? He said, hey, Jeff. And I said, you know what? Your lawn is bad for my marriage. <laughs> he laughed, and he said, I'll trade you. He's retired. He says, my kids are all grown. Pretty much all I got is the lawn. I said, could you come over and talk to my wife about <laughs> You're falling behind. You're not doing enough. They're doing more. Their life looks better than yours. We've all got those voices in our heads. A great illustration of this is the 1981 movie Chariots of Fire. Perhaps some of you have seen this or know about it. If you haven't, it's not, uh, it's not action-packed, but it's a fantastic story. It's a true story about two Brit great r runners in Great Britain in 1924 Olympics in Paris. One named Eric Liddell, a Christian and one named Harold Abrahams, who was a secular Jew. Both uh, gifted sprinters. And I won't go into the whole story, but there's two lines that each of them say in the course of the movie, which I don't know if those are actual lines those men ever uttered, but they capture this point. Harold Abrahams says, when the gun goes off, I feel like I have 10 seconds to justify my existence in this world. Eric Liddell said, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. Can you hear the, the incredible difference? Both gifted sprinters in the Olympics. One says, I'm running to prove that I matter. One is saying, I know who I am, and I'm running to feel his pleasure. There's all the difference in the world, and that gets to the heart of what, it, what the Bible means when it talks about rest. You live your life to prove who, that you matter? Are you living your life to prove something to yourself, to your father, Who's, or your mother, or your co-workers, or your spouse, or yourself, or to God? Just trying hard? Or do you know who you are in Christ, and you rest in that, and when you run, or work, or whatever, you feel his pleasure? That, that's a perfect illustration, I think, of what is being talked about here at the deepest level. In verses 8 through 10 of Hebrews chapter 4, we read these words, For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Verse 10, For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. That, that, that's a, I know it's, it, it can be cryptic a little bit. Talk about Joshua, what does that mean? What it's saying is when you enter into God's rest, when you recognize who you are in Christ, and you're not trying to prove yourself to the world or to God, but you know that you matter because Christ died for you, then you rest from this, right? This kind of life. You rest from your work. You rest in what God has done. <coughs> Perhaps the best answer to the question for a Christian, what do you do, is I trust Jesus. That's what I do. I live for him. I'm not suggesting you say that, but you could try it on the train on the way to work this week. Sabbath rest is a deeper rest where you're not a slave to the cultural expectations. You're not a slave to your own ridiculous self-expectations. Whoever has entered God's rest has rested from his or her work. One man running to prove who he is, one man who knows who he is and running to feel God's pleasure. Which one do you want to be? I want to be this guy. 
I, with all my heart, I want to be this guy. Sometimes I'm over here, I have to be honest, sometimes I slip back over here. And, and you might find this surprising, but even in the church, it can be kind of a treadmill. I'm not as spiritual as you might think. Even in the church, it can be kind of, I'm going to prove that we matter, that I matter. I want to be over here. I want to rest in what Jesus Christ has done. I want that to set me free so that all the labor of my life, whatever that is, as a dad, as a husband, as a pastor, as a friend, is to feel his pleasure, to know, to know that I'm his. Not, not to try to earn it. Last, the person of rest. So first, the promise. There is still a rest available for all of you. It's not just once upon a time long ago in the garden God rested from his creation, nor is it the promised land. Those are all pointing to a rest that's available to us in Christ. The power of it to set us free, right, from these two. And then now the person. How does it happen? St. Augustine wrote the book Confessions, and some of you have read that. Maybe you had to read it years ago. You should read it again if you... Uh, he's got a famous line in there where he says, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. Such a profound statement. He says, God made you for himself, and you are going to be restless until you figure that out, until you rest in him. This is what the writer of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11 means when he says, God has set eternity in the hearts of men and women, but they have not understood what he's done from beginning to end. There's a God-shaped hole. Have you heard that phrase? That's what Ecclesiastes 3 is saying. There's a restlessness in you until you find the one place you're made to rest. How does that happen? Let me read verse 11 through 13 of chapter 4, which when you first read this, sound totally out of place. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. That sounds like, wait a minute, we just said we're not supposed to strive. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart, And no creature is hidden from its sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Doesn't it sound like you just changed subjects suddenly? Sabbath rest, and then all of a sudden there's this stuff about the Word of God. Word of God is typically there uh, interpreted or understood to mean the Bible, God's Word. And it does mean that, but it means something more. Not, Not less, but more than. Here's what I mean. First of all, when this was written, Hebrews was written, the New Testament didn't exist all, all yet. It hadn't all been written or compiled. So it, does it just mean the Old Testament? Is that what he's saying is the Word of God? How do we understand the New Testament? Secondly, the word for Word of God is the Greek word logos. It's the same word that John uses in John chapter 1 to refer to Jesus, the Son of God. The Word, the logos, the Word of God. The Word made flesh. And let me read it again and see if you, how, how it sounds to you if I replace logos with Jesus or place word with Jesus. For Jesus is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow. And Jesus discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from Jesus' sight, but all are naked, exposed to the eyes of Jesus, to whom we must give an account. I think ultimately what this is saying to us is, yeah, the word of God, the written word of God, is living and active, but because it points us to the one, the, the word of God, Jesus Christ. He's the person of rest, the author of it, if you will. Verses 12 and 13, I think, are to be understood that the way you enter into God's rest is to let Jesus Christ and his word lay you open. Do you know that phrase, um, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed? Sounds mildly threatening. That's a reference back in some ways to Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve, who were in the end of chapter 2, naked and not ashamed, in restful, peaceful relationship with God, they sin, they disobey, and what's the instant reaction? Realization that they're naked. Cover up, hide from each other and from God. So what Hebrews is saying to us is, the way you enter into God's rest is to go back to that place where God says, where are you? And he sees you. And you can't hide. And it's all laid bare. All the stuff that you pretend doesn't exist when you're with your buddies, with your friends, at work, even with your spouse that you, 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 you ignore or don't want to talk about. All that stuff gets laid bare under the spotlight. In fact, the very phrase um, laid bare is the Greek word trachelizo. It's where we get our word tracheotomy from. 
it refers to the act of the priest in the temple who would take the sacrificial animal's head, lift it up, and slice the throat of a sacrificial animal to drain the lifeblood. That sounds gross. Why is that in there? Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the point is this. The Word of God, Jesus, lays your soul open, but doesn't cut you and kill you. That happened to him. He was cut off. He was pierced. He was bruised. He was wounded so that you wouldn't have to be, so that you could find rest and freedom in him. It's really an unbelievable. I don't think I ever grasped the profound depth of this passage before. What's being said to us? Last, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, 28 and 29, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Which kind of man and woman do you want to be? The one who's constantly trying to prove, even if it's to yourself, that you matter, that your life is worth something. Or the one who knows that because of Jesus, I can rest, I'm secure, I belong to him. There remains, Hebrews says, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. A place of belonging and security and identity that you cannot get by force of labor or effort. You can only get by surrendering to him. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this ancient passage which at first reading confuses us. But thank you that you speak to our hearts with clarity about who you are. God, I ask for everyone here who's still trying to prove that they matter, still trying to pay off old debts in their hearts and their souls or earn their way, God, would you speak words of rest to their soul and let them know that because of Jesus, they can lay all that down and rest in what he has done. We thank you, God, that you've done this for us, that you've accomplished what we could not, that you've set us free and called us, your sons and daughters, into your family, not just so someday we get to heaven, but that we might live for your glory and your purpose even now. How we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in the grace and freedom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who says to me, Come, all who are weary and heavy with labor, for I will give you rest. Amen? And go in peace.